What's up, my people? Here we are today with Robert Barnhart, a gentleman who I've become friends with and also has the uh, privilege to be the only person on two boards, one of which is MAPS.org, Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Studies, who's on the forefront of MDMA research, and also the Hefter Institute, which is on the forefront of psilocybin research, two of the real kind of icons and institutions in the in the psychedelic science and medicine uh, space. So welcome, my friend. Thank you, Aubrey. It's great to be here this morning. Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad we could make this work. Yeah. So we got to figure out how, you know, how a gentleman such as yourself winds up in in the space and and having the ability to be on the board of, of two of these institutions that I fully believe are going to be, you know, doing some of the most important work to benefit society in the years to come in making these medicines available. So how'd you how'd you wind up being in this position? Yes, um, well, it's a p- position that I enjoy being in, and it's certainly very important work. Um, going back some years. Um, When I was younger, I had some experiences with these medicines myself that um, led me to understand that they're they're very important and more research is needed. Mm -hmm. Um, When did you get started in that? um, During my uh, during my high school years. Yeah. Now, what's interesting then? um, I have some experiences. You go to school on Monday. I'm certainly not going to tell anybody about this when you have a deep psychedelic experience and you understand your oneness with the universe. <laughs> you go to high school on Monday morning and you talk Wait, about Wait, what it. do you mean? What are you talking about? High school isn't a fertile ground for exploring deep psychic and consciousness work? <laughs> and they're going to lock you up. But my, <laughs> my, my thought back then was, is during the week, and this was whatever, the early 70s, I thought back then during the week, your teachers discuss theory with you in school. You have maybe one teacher, you'd have, you'd have your English teacher, your math teacher, algebra, whatever, and you'd have a psychedelic teacher. Mm-hmm. And the teacher would teach you, you talk about theory. This, is, this cl- is hypothetical. Hypothetical, of this course. This didn't happen. <laughs> didn't happen. No, no, no way. Okay, good. No way. Um, yeah. I, I, I went to the, the Kincaid High School in Houston, Texas very conservative uh, high school. And then <clears throat> it would have been great if it had happened. In any case, then my thought was, young teenager, that on the weekend we should have an experiential experiential um, class. Workshop. Field trip. Field trip, exactly. And that seemed like a good idea because contrary to what I'd heard and what I'd been taught, is it occurred to me that these medicines, when used right, correctly, properly, had a lot of intelligence to them mm-hmm. and were worthwhile. I was quite shocked. So if we move forward a number of years to say the late 80s, <clears throat> I was seeing a family therapist over some issues with my stepfather. And I'd, I finally opened up to him about my interest in these uh, psychedelic medicines and psychoactive sacred substances. And this therapist says, probably 28 years old, I was 28 years old. He says, why don't you see what's happening in the field? I said, at first I thought this guy was going to lock me up when I first started seeing him. See what's happening in the field. I said, field? He says, yeah. So I wrote some letters to Andy Weil. Tim Leary was alive then. Mm -hmm. A few other people, anybody I could think of. And I got letters back. Andy wrote me back. Tim wrote me back. One of the things they said in there was, you should get in touch with this guy named Rick Doblin. Oh, wow. So I, I, I wrote Rick a, a letter. I didn't hear back. I wrote him another letter. I didn't hear back. I wrote him a third letter, and I heard back. And he letter, later told me that, that he, uh, at that time, he didn't think I had any credibility, so he didn't answer me. But the third time, he believes in persistence, and he wanted to see who was being so persistent. <laughs> that's a really valuable lesson. So, there. Aubrey, that's that's how I first um, actually became active in the field when I wrote those letters. 
And for everybody who doesn't know, Rick Doblin is the head of maps.org. Yeah. yeah. So um, this was uh, about 84, 85, before Rick had started MAPS, he had an organization called Earth Metabolic Design. Mm, and MAPS was, is better. And <laughs> easier to say. <laughs> and, and I was <clears throat> involved with him a little bit on that. And then there were hearings back in the summer of 1985 on whether or not to schedule MDMA, summer of 85. And... Um, I believe there were three hearings on the West Coast, Midwest, and East Coast. I might not be. They should have had to take MDMA during the hearing when they were making their decision. That should have been the, that should have been the requirement. That should have been it. <laughs> and, and, and as many people may may know, um, the uh, the federal law judge, I think his name was Francis Young, decided that his decision was MDMA should be placed in Schedule Three, um, which is a same schedule I believe Valium's in, mm -hmm. and um, the uh, Aubrey, the, the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Agency, overruled that and put it in Schedule 1. How rude. How is that even their prerogative? <clears throat> yeah, I, it, does, it doesn't make did sense. We elect, did we elect them? No. I didn't vote for them. No. <laughs> <laughs> seems, seems unconstitutional yeah. to me. Um, so... Uh, Rick, at this point, who is, uh, I think he's got his undergraduate degree at this point from New College in Florida, and uh, he forms the Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Studies with the main goal of, uh, of uh, moving MDMA from Schedule 1 to Schedule 2 or Schedule 3, and Rick being a, uh, uh, a good... Uh, enterprising Jewish boy at this point. He looks at the system and thinks, I'll take it one step at a time. I'll work within the system and I'll, I'll get this done. I'll accomplish it. Mm -hmm. And he ended up going to Harvard and getting a master's there and then a doctorate in public policy. So he had the credentials to do what he wanted. Yep. So how did I get into this? One of the first things you've got to do is prove that a medicine is safe for humans to take. So we needed to do rat studies. So I assisted him um, with uh, uh, funding to do a rat study. I think it was $2,500 to give rats MDMA and then uh, look at them. Did you, play, did you play house music for the rats? See, uh, you know, they, you, should they, have told, you should have totally played some house. Oh, I guess it was they, the 80s. Maybe there was no house music. They, so played some, played some good, you know, Michael Jackson or something for them. Uh, they, I think those rats had a good time until they met, <laughs> until they met their maker. And until they met their LD50. It, it, was a, uh, it was a difficult decision for me, though. I have uh, do some Tibetan Buddhist practice and, mm -hmm. and uh, do my best to have some compassion so the idea of sacrificing these rats but the cost benefit sure. for a few rats for perhaps many millions of people um felt worthwhile to me so we did the rats and um at least if the rats have to go robert you mean it, it, well, you, got a, you got them mdma before they left it's safe in rats mm -hmm. at least we should have taken it off of schedule one for the rats so yeah. they could you know <laughs> so the rats could party party a little bit yeah so uh, um, work out some of their rat issues, you know? Yeah, fine. They're, that, they're always trying to hold each other down, you know? You get that analogy about rats. One tries to climb out, everybody pulls them back. Maybe if they got some MDMA, they'd be like, good for you, fellow rat. <laughs> go, go seek the light. Seek better, greener pastures, my friend. It cha could change the whole rat societal structure. A, a little heart opening. <laughs> a little the... heart opening, yeah. yeah. We're not going to claw you back down to the rest of us. Mm -hmm. Go for it, yeah. fine rat. Yeah. <laughs> now that's that's an interesting research idea there. Yeah. See if <laughs> that would be that would be pretty interesting. But so, more importantly, we got to get this out to the veterans because that's uh, that's I think of all the MDMA research, you know, that seems to be the group that I think Rick has correctly identified as this really highly, and it's a group that really needs it. So there there are strong indications that MDMA is very beneficial in the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder, mm -hmm. which these veterans coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan, as I understand it, are, are 
really suffering with. And the statistics I've heard, which I actually find hard to believe, but it's what I've heard that we have one service person a day committing suicide yeah. because of this PTSD, which is tragic. Um, so um, I just got back from a meeting with Rick and um, there are currently four studies going on with MAPS working with the Veterans Administration giving MDMA to veterans in um, conjunction with the Veterans Administration using both their therapeutic protocols and the therapeutic protocols that MAPS has worked out with the Federal Drug Administration. So this is quite a breakthrough when we can say that we have a, a branch of the government, the Veterans Administration, that's now uh, that working with MAPS. Yeah, and so some people might hear that and say, oh, well, Veterans Administration won't know what to do. And that's not necessarily the case. You know, I, I think, as I've heard from many of the shamans, the, the medicine is more the medium than the message, you know? So mm -hmm. the medium that allows what might be an ineffective message coming from the Veterans Association without the medium of the medicine, you know, it might just not be able to penetrate deeply enough. But with the MDMA, it could be very good therapy that they're able to provide and probably is, but there's just no conduit to kind of get in there. Now, of course, I'm sure it could get adjusted and, you know, work with the strengths of the medicine and understand that power. But, um, you know, what, what all of these medicines do is they just really allow other things to come through you know i mean the, the medicines themselves aren't making the change it's your mind it's the guide it's the counseling it's it's everything out they're the medium yeah i uh, i i agree with that and th that's the understanding that this um the the breakthrough or the heart opening or the being able to look at the trauma let it go process it forgive yourself forgive the people that were involved with it it's not in the pill or the plant mm -hmm. necessarily or the medicine. That's a key that locks something that's already inside of you. Yeah. But if, I, I, I'm not a medical doctor, but as I understand it, these these uh, the post traumatic stress disorder is so traumatic that, like you said, the therapy can't break through that wall yep. to even even begin to work. So. Um, they have the Veterans Administration has some success with their therapeutic protocols, but I'm um, not quite not, not quite doing it. Not quite doing, doing it. it a, a, just yeah. a small per percentage of the time. So the hope is exactly like you said, that the MDMA can make a, a crack in the wall where the people can feel safe, in a safe setting, to live the relive in their mind whatever the ho horrific trauma is and and process it so they can let go of it and move on with their life. So the studies that have been out have been overwhelmingly effective that MAPS has already done. Uh, overwhelming. That's and and so, you know, I was watching, did you see the movie Dallas Buyers Club? No, I didn't. Well, it, anyways, it just reminded me of a phenomenon that happened with the, you know, so the AIDS epidemic hit and everybody was freaking out. There were no approved treatments. And, um, everybody was looking for an answer. So they actually, they had this this prospective drug, AZT, that ended up being a total disaster, didn't work, made people worse. But it was a prospective cure. They had some sketchy little science that said it might work. And the FDA basically fast-tracked it, got it approved on very limited data because of the overwhelming need. People were dying from, from AIDS. Yeah. I wonder if there's, you know, because Rick has a schedule, I think it's 2021 that he's targeting, you know, the way that all the trials are going. But with a serviceman committing suicide every day and with, you know, you wonder at what point, you know, a decision like that isn't made like, hey, we got enough data on safety. We got this is this is really working. We need this, you know, and turn that fast track switch. We're hopeful that they're going to fast track it, that we'll be able to get them to do that. Mm -hmm. um, where these studies take place in three stages, stage one, two, and three. Stage one is the, the monkey and, and rat trials. Um, stage two is small populations where you run one study with 
10 or 20 people with one team of doctors. Stage three is where you have multiple sites, maybe running 10 studies at, at a time, multiple, um, multiple therapists with perhaps 100 people in, in each study. When we get into these phase three studies, it's Rick's hope that then they're, we're going to work towards fast tracking this mm-hmm. ex- exactly like you said. Yeah, I mean, it only it only makes sense with the with the need that's out there. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So let's talk a little bit about you know that seems to be on you know on a, on a good course. But let's talk a little bit about what Hefter's doing, and they're working with psilocybin. Were they responsible for the Johns Hopkins study as well? Um, they're res- responsible for the the Johns Hopkins study. Now you're talking about the study with the healthy normals. The healthy normals. Yeah, Th- this is a very interesting study that mm-hmm. the FDA approved because this is a study with approximately 20 people to see if psilocybin, which is, I'm sure everybody knows, but it's the, the extract from the uh, magic, magic mushrooms, psilocybin cubensis, and mm-hmm. it has some other names, um, that, um, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, yeah, so what, um, what this is looking at, this is very interesting, is that you're seeing if psilocybin can occasion a spiritual experience in individuals that has lasting meaning over time. So the study was run, and it was um, statistically very, very positive in that I believe it was everybody but one person in the study had a spiritual experience that was in the top top five of their life. Mm-hmm. People said it was up there, like when you have a a, a, a child childbirth or I don't know, yeah, getting married, whatever, well, yeah, whatever it would be in your life that would be a wonderful thing that holds meaning. The best pizza that Orlando has ever had, is that right? That gives you value over time. You wake up in the morning, you're glad to be alive. This, this study showed that, th- that that can happen. And there are markers for what a, a spiritual experience is that Walter Pankey worked out years ago. Um, and they, is, this was a, 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 a meticulously designed scientific experience. And, and some people, a good experiment, like 40% you. of the people or something said it was the top, <laughs> top experience in their life, the number yeah. one best experience in their life. Yeah, number, number one. It was really, uh, uh, so... This is uh, what this shows is is these medicines are not just useful for people that have PTSD or are suffering from cancer. Now Hefter's also working with running studies with people that you call near end cancer patients, people with terminal cancer that don't have long to live. But what that study shows is that scientifically, is these medicines could be beneficial for. Um, people who don't necessarily have some crippling medical problem and that I once had a rubber stamp that said you don't have to be sick to get better yeah so and w- when we're we, so Hefter has been giving uh, in again meticulous scientific studies and I should I should mention both with Hefter and maps with the MDMA and psilocybin we're not just giving somebody a pill like we would Prozac or Zoloft there's extensive um, uh, therapeutic counseling before the session, after the session, and then during the session. The uh, because these experiences are the are this uh, energy or this love or heartfelt feeling is inside of all of us. The therapists are not directing the session; they're just facilitating it, being there for the person to talk to them if they need to talk to, because we all have this innate wisdom inside ourselves. If you give somebody the opportunity, their own innate love and wisdom can can come out. Mm-hmm. And then there's therapeutic uh, follow-up uh, um, after that. Yep. So it's, uh, it's uh, to some extent, and the, the researchers, I'm not sure if, well, th- this is really like a, a modern... What way I look at it, like a modern ritual that's being created, mm-hmm. if you will. Um, it may not be everybody's cup of tea to go down to the jungle in Peru, sit up with all the insects and noises and and uh, indigenous songs, 
um, and then go back to their job on Monday, mm -hmm. they, they might be more inclined to go down to their therapist's office and spend a day down there with them. And, and, and this is a, maybe accessible to more, to Absolutely. more people. I mean, it, uh, when I look at out at the future, of this, and, and once you get, you know, once this does get approved, because it seems with the evidence being overwhelming, you know, I remember I was at, at the MAPS conference and I was one of the doctors who had been administering the psilocybin and palliative care had been a psychiatrist for, you know, 40 years or some, some really long time. And he said, basically one session with psilocybin was equal to three years of therapy at least you know and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and and for him to say that and he's he wasn't you know he's he's been working with these people his whole life he's seen the results you know three years of talking or three hours <laughs> with a patient who's taken psilocybin you know and when you see results like that i think the inevitability of this getting approved is extremely high i i, I would agree and that seems to be the consensus is with the therapy, the medicine plus the therapy, one, one session can be worth some years of work. Mm -hmm. um, the, yeah. The one funny story that, it, that they mentioned, though, is it's a double blind, you know, placebo controlled study. So, double blind meaning that not, not only the patient doesn't know, but the practitioner isn't supposed to know who is getting the medicine or not. Mm -hmm. But it's a funny dilemma because um, it's not like a very subtle effect when somebody is taking a large amount of MDMA or psilocybin. You know, I mean, if you have if you have half your wits about you, you'll, you'll pretty much be sure that uh, that something's going on there. I think they give them some niacin or something as the as the other placebo. It's niacin or nicotinic acid. Yeah. Um, yeah, it just gives a, a little flush, or yeah. and um, to, it, does your ass itch, or do you feel like you're communicating with God? I don't know. <laughs> One or the other is happening right now, and it's hard for me to tell what's going on. <laughs> it, it, it's it's true. Um, there does seem to be a uh, what's the word? Um, uh, almost like. Um, I don't know, nursery school or kindergarten quality to the studies. It's like, could we all grow up and understand this? These medicines are so powerful. The idea of doing a double blind yeah. placebo is, uh, it, it doesn't <laughs> make sense. It's a little ridiculous. It's a little ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, hopefully it'll go. So let's, so let's look off into the future here and let's presume, you know, things don't get really fucked up, which I think probably some nagging doubt in our mind might be that some bad stuff is going to have to happen before good stuff. But let's say that doesn't happen. Let's say everything kind of goes pretty smoothly. We're off into the future. These medicines are legal. Um, what kind of world? What kind of world do you see? Have you thought about this kind of utopian vision where all these things are legal and how they're <coughs> accessible to society? Yes, Aubrey. Yeah. Um, I uh, I envision where you might have uh, um, treatment centers. Um, preferably res residential treatment centers, um, perhaps a nice location out in the country where you're not in the big city, but you could perhaps have them in a city too, where um, you could have a have a treatment center where somebody could could uh, check into it, like a, almost like a, a bit of like a resort mm -hmm. setting, like a canyon ranch. Yeah, perhaps psychedelic canyon ranch. <laughs> perhaps. Um, uh, um, and then somebody could check in. These experiences can be quite dramatic, particularly mm -hmm. if somebody's suffering from PTSD and they've been really crippled, they're not functioning, and then they have this heart opening, they're ever able to forgive and let go. They may need a few days before they come back to their regular life. So um, I, I, I envision these um, treatment centers where somebody might see their therapist for a couple of months, two, three months, six months in the city, and then when they're ready, they mm -hmm. go out to the treatment center and spend a week or two there. Yep. Perhaps for more intensive work, somebody might want to spend six weeks or a couple of months there, just like people do now when they go down to Peru to use ayahuasca for an extended stay. They might uh, check into these treatment centers. 
Um, I don't envision going by the uh, 7-Eleven and uh, picking up a, a pack a pack of this mm-hmm. um, and then um, at this point um, or, or, or ever. But um, I do envision the, these uh, treatment centers around the around the country. These uh, these medicines aren't for everybody. Some people don't have the inclination. For many people, normal therapy works. Some people are well adjusted to their life. They don't want any change. Mm-hmm. They're just fine. Um, but for those individuals that are suffering with problems or those people that they call healthy normals that want to benefit <clears throat> from these medicines, um, they, they, I qualify they, as a healthy normal, but I'm not quite sure I'm all that healthy or all that normal. <laughs> so, yeah. And I think you could probably say that for most people. Most people. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you, too. Um, I, I, I think I qualify as a healthy normal, um, but I um, can always use a little more help to <laughs> yeah. open my yeah. heart and get clarity of mind and sure. let go of the past and live in the present. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, yeah, indeed. That's uh, yeah. You get I get that question a lot. Like, well, well, why do you even do it? I mean, it looks like things are good. Were you unhappy, or, or are you sick, or and uh, mm-hmm. you know, it's not that. You know, it's that. What more can you bring into your life? Like, what other awareness? What other connection? What other different perspective can you add and i can't say there's an area of my life that it hasn't helped from physical health to mental health to emotional health to connection with source to even planning you know i mean i I made a major shift in my company here part of the reason why this is all here is i shifted from one um vertical to a completely other one in creating alpha brain you know maybe i would have come to that conclusion anyways but i saw that clearly you know, when I was on an ayahuasca journey down in the jungle, I saw the line I was headed on and it was almost like a constricted artery. You know, there's like a little blood flow going through. But then if I took a little detour, I saw that everything was wide open and this heart of abundance was just pumping through these veins. I was like, oh, I think I need to go that way and shifted everything, launched Alpha Brain. And, you know, it was, it was an idea that we we're going, but I just threw all, because I saw it, I threw all the remaining resources that way. And, you know, that's been responsible for this. So, so many practical reasons. And, and that's one of the things that I'm, I really like getting out there is because I can talk to other CEOs and entrepreneurs and, and look at them and say, hey, you know, this isn't just some woo woo, you know, you need to get in touch with your spirituality. This can help you in extremely practical ways too mm-hmm. you know and i think there was some there was some lsd studies back um a while ago that work with like um people in physics and mathematics yeah uh, oscar oscar yaniger i think that's how you pronounce his mm-hmm. name he was d- doing those d- right d- did did these studies w- working with architects doctors um engineers he'd uh, he'd give them a problem to consider for a while and then they would come in He'd give him the medicine, and he got incredible results. I don't remember the numbers on it, but it was very, very promising. And there was a, uh, it's a book that came out a few years ago on that. I think Maria Dobkin Rios was the author. I may have her name a little bit wrong, but yeah, it was very, very promising. And then when all of the this uh, was shut down in '72 with the war on drugs, all that. All that went away. All that research went away. You know, you imagine some of like the great minds of our time, you know, and and you imagine what might happen if this was acceptable. Because you find with these really, you know, very powerful scientists, scientific minds, many of them are not open to this kind of discussion. You know, I know Joe Rogan's had discussions with a lot of them and they're very reticent towards it just because of whatever bias they may have. But you wonder like what, what things are just waiting under the surface to be uncovered what new energy sources Mm -hmm. or what you know so so when people think about these psychedelic medicines becoming legal there's these other channels that these other kind of ramifications that we're not even we don't even have our eyes on you know but let's say one of these guys goes in to feel a little better about his relationship with his mother or his wife and all of a sudden you know he's like 
holy shit, I just figured out that problem for sustainable energy. You know, like you never know what could come out of this. You never know. And there's a feeling in the in the media that um, a lot of this is, is uh, these medicines are the kind of thing you're going to sit there and see pink elephants uh, walk out of the wall and feel very strange and it's going to be this unusual experience. But there's... A, they can actually be very sobering mm -hmm. and put you in touch with, with with what is real, what works in your life, and clear some of the the uh, mistaken conceptions one might have out of one's mind. So just like making this decision with your work, and you saw if you took this pass, it's, it's not going to work. But if I go this way, this yeah. will open up. Um, a practical application for me in my life growing up in America watching TV is I didn't feel a connection with <clears throat> the natural environment. And um, so this has a very practical application for me. I, I realized uh, I need clean water to drink. I need fresh air to breathe. I need to eat decent, wholesome food. And that comes from our ecosystem. We live in a closed system here on the planet Earth and I'm part of my world. This isn't like some tree hugger philosophy. Mm -hmm. It just makes sense. I need air, fresh air and clean water. And as part of it, I have some responsibility. So let me engage with my world and the way I live so that I can take care of, my, take care of the, the planet. And th this is so polarized between environmentalists and Republican senators or whatever, what have you, this isn't a polarized issue. This is just a basic human issue that yeah. our children and we all, we, we need, a, we need a, an environment that we don't pollute our air, pollute our water. So this is a practical, a very practical application where we're just looking at this, the basic survival needs that we need as an expanding population on a um, in an environment that's a, a closed, a closed circuit. Yeah. If we don't take care of it, we're not gonna we're not gonna be able to live. Sure. So, so th this is important to me with these medicines. That's an that's a area that you see this in anecdotal reports, but there's certainly been no study on this, as far as I know, how this affects people. So you're talking about Yoniger's study and and solving creative problems and I'm talking about be becoming developing some responsibility for the environment uh, these are these are things that haven't been been sure and I had a very strong connection with that when I was down in Peru and did the Wachuma I had a vision of mother earth and I had a vision of the oils being pulled out of her body and like suctioned out with the big you know syringes and then plastics burning on our skin and, and all of this kind of horrible dystopian vision of what we're doing to the earth yeah. and she actually spoke to me i'm obviously on on the medicine at this point and uh, you know i was really upset disturbed by this vision i said what what can i do what can i do mm -hmm. and she says we don't have an environmental problem we have a consciousness problem it's like you help with the consciousness you know spread the message and i'll take care of the rest you know, yeah. and yeah. that was the message. And, and and for me, it was this deep understanding of the principle of reciprocity, you know, having a great love and appreciation for the earth. And then the principle of reciprocity, knowing that you want to protect it and give back for this great gift and this fucking awesome opportunity we have to be on this amazing planet. You know, sometimes I just look back and I think like, what a fucking cool planet. Like if we didn't come from this and we put Earth on a movie or showed that Planet Earth documentary, we'd be like, man, Earth is amazing. It's the coolest place ever, you know? But but we're here and we're, you know, we just watch TV and we don't even really tap into it. And I say we in the collective because even us, we've been in that position ourselves. But a little bit of awakening and awareness to that and you want to fight to protect it. You know, you realize how special it is. You love it. I have a family. I have a uh, young daughter that I dearly love. I'm a, a good father. I really enjoy taking care of her. Mm -hmm. Whatever part I can do to help the, this world, this earth, be livable for her and her descendants, I'll check in with her and go, hey, how is it being a little girl? Do you, do, is, yeah. Are you glad you're here? 
She'll go, Daddy, I love it. I'm really happy. She's so enthusiastic. That's awesome. Just naturally. So uh, I want to leave a good, uh, whatever small part I can play to leave a good planet for her. And these, uh, I grew up like many, I walk around my neighborhood sometimes at night and there's so many, you see through the windows, TVs going or the light of TV and um, you know, that, that's fine. I don't, don't have any, any judgment there. But if we're staring at our computers, staring at our TV, sitting in our cars, sitting in our office, and we're not getting out to see the beauty of, of uh, nature, what kind of life is that? And mm. there's a strong indication that these medicines can help one appreciate the beauty of our world. And they did that for me being born in the 50s and growing up with a lot of television and uh, I didn't realize how beautiful the natural world is and our ecosystem is oh the the sunrise and the sunset are beautiful that butterfly is beautiful yeah that cloud um, just to put it in old-fashioned religious terms God is such an amazing artist how did he or she or make that cloud Look, <laughs> Aubrey check this cloud out and, <laughs> yeah, yeah and not to sound silly but um the natural world really is beautiful yeah when you lose that sense of awe you know at what's going on you know that's one thing that the medicines can bring back and, and I I thought about it too I was like you know if if someone really loves something you know like really loves it they don't actively work to destroy it unless they're a real psychopath you know, like mm -hmm. you have to be a psychopath and want to hurt what you love and destroy what you love. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking of these people hurting and destroying our natural environment. And I'm thinking, well, the problem must be either A, there's two choices. Either A, they're fucking psychopaths because they're destroying something they love. Or they don't really love what they're destroying. You know, or B, they don't see the connection. But I think it's more, you know, the other one that they just don't really love the earth enough. You know, they're not connected enough to want to protect it. They don't have that sense of awe about what the opportunity we have to live here is or else they would want to do that. And kind of wiping free the lens of perception, you know, can, can really give you that sense of like, oh, man, that is this is pretty fucking cool. You know, and when you get that feeling, then that's when you want to fight for it, because, you know, we're we're not, we're monkeys that like to fight for what we love. And, uh, and getting that love back for the earth, you know, people will fight for it again. I, I think that's key, what you said about the, the, the consciousness of realizing that you love the planet. Yeah. And one gets to the point where um, I didn't grow up in my upbringing with the phrase, uh, love yourself. I think, um, what did, uh, you know, um, uh, it's something that uh, Jesus said about, um, you know, love other people the way you love, love yourself. Love, love your neighbor as thyself. Yeah, that's it, yeah. So, oh, so if I don't love myself, I'm not going to know how to love my neighbor. So, I, 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 that's, the, that's amazing that you said that because that's we were. I was just talking about that this, with an author, Ted Decker, who's really conscious, but he's he writes in Christian fiction. And we were talking about that. And people think if you tell someone, Love thy neighbor as, as you love thyself. The hard part in their mind, they think, oh man, I, my neighbor, he's kind of weird. I don't know if I want to love him. The, the hard part of that statement isn't loving your neighbor. The hard part of that statement is loving yourself. Yeah. You know, and once you love yourself sufficiently, it's easy to love your neighbor. But that's the hard one. And, and you could say, oh, I love myself. I love myself. And it's just kind of this intellectual idea. I love myself. But <clears throat> there are, are ways to break through one's ego where you can see that I not only love myself, but because the universe is filled with love, this love is just naturally radiating out of my heart. So, and, and I'm not separate from my world. It's really all one. So I love myself. I'm naturally going to love other people. And then you love the planet because that what the planet gave birth to all of mm -hmm. this life. Yep. And and it, it's just um, planet gives birth to form as we know and, it. And we we know something, we understand it, and and then we 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 love it. You know it and you and you love it. If you don't know it, 
you, you can't love it. That's right. That's right. Well, Robert, thank you for stopping by and sharing sharing some love here on the podcast. You're uh, you're welcome, Aubrey. Um, I enjoyed talking with you this morning. Yeah, definitely. We've had we had a good panel. I really like that format of that panel we did in this discussion here in Austin. I've got a shameless plug. Um, Do it to make. Um, I uh, in the next um, next month here by the end of uh, end of July or by the time you're listening to this, um, it'll be finished. I'm uh, right on the verge of completing a film called A New Understanding: The Science of Psilocybin which is about the research that the Hefter Institute is doing with uh, psilocybin. So uh, I hope everyone can, uh, can go to a, a theater in their neighborhood or um, as much as I have uh, talked about television and the dangers of television, tune in to your local channel to watch, <laughs> oh, yeah. a, watch a new understanding. Get it. Get on it. I can't wait to watch that. That'll be great. Yeah. That'll be yeah. great. Uh, any other any other ways that people can get in touch or maybe um, you know donate uh, to Maps or Hefter? Or? All this research is uh, currently is privately funded because these uh, these medicines are in the public domain. They they cannot be patented, so there's no incentive for big pharma to invest in this. And this is really important um, research with the war on drugs and so many people incarcerated or in jail. It, it's really criminal that this is happening to these individuals. Um, so all this, all this research is privately funded. So the uh, MAPS and the Hefter Research Institute truly need donations from people, whether it's a dollar or $5 million, whatever anyone can give is deeply appreciated and the money is well used. So you can, you can find out all this information on www.maps.org and www.hefter.org. One F or two Fs? Two Fs. Two Fs. H-E-F-F-T-E-R. Mm -hmm. It's named after um, Arthur Hefter, who was the first person to synthesize a psychedelic medicine. He synthesized mescaline from the peyote cactus back in... I won't have my date quite right, but it's roughly somewhere around 1897. Hats off to you, Mr. Hefter. <laughs> Good job. And thank you to you, Robert. That was, that was awesome. Look forward to more conversations in the future. Thank you, Aubrey. Definitely. Take care, everyone.